Well, from my point of view, the most important thing that we can learn from Kant is precisely what we have been talking about at this conference, namely the uh, profound value of human freedom and how we need to uh, structure our individual lives and our society in order to allow for the fullest realization of, of human freedom. Um, I think there are there are difficulties in Kant. Uh, the question of uh, just exactly how he uh, argues for the fundamental value of human freedom uh, in many ways remains obscure over the course of his uh, recorded intellectual career of uh, 50 years. He tried out various different strategies for arguing for the fundamental value of freedom. Um, early on, he explores what I regard as essentially uh, psychological arguments. He tries to demonstrate how we get a higher degree of satisfaction, you might even say happiness, from exercising our own choice rather than from having others act for us. Later on, he explores uh, what I regard as metaphysical arguments. Uh, it's of the essence uh, of a human being to have a uh, free and rational will and to uh, anything that constrains that is causes a kind of metaphysical problem. It conflicts with the very essence of human nature. Both of these kinds of argumentation have uh, their problems. Uh, in the end, perhaps we have to fall back on what calls, Kant calls the, the fact of reason, just a, a fundamental intuition that, uh, that freedom is valuable when you think about any particular end that you might have, when you think about the possibility that Others might uh, realize that end for you in some way that you no longer have choice about whether you want that or not. And perhaps you realize that it's having choice which is more important to you even than realizing uh, any pr the results of any particular choice. And then you have to fall back perhaps on an argument like that. But whatever the problem is at this foundational level, it seems to me that Kant um, does a brilliant job of uh, showing both what the fundamental value, how the fundamental value of freedom requires us to organize our thought about our own lives, that's essentially the subject matter of what he, what he calls ethics, and how the fundamental value of freedom requires us to organize our social lives, and that's fundamental, that's basically what he calls um, Recht, or the sphere of law and politics. And, uh, Ultimate, although I work on many other things, that's sort of really what keeps me interested in, in Kant and what I think is the enduring value of Kant, to take that attitude towards our own work as well. Well, I, I think that's uh, also very complicated. Um, Rawls was teaching at Harvard when I was a student. I, I heard his lectures on, on Kant's ethics. Um, I've, Rawls was uh, a profound man in, in many ways, and he had tremendous respect for Kant and for all important figures in the history of philosophy. Um, so he was wonderful to study with. Um, but I, uh, unlike some of his other students, I do think that his understanding of well, the use that he made of Kant was somewhat limited. Um, and be in certain ways became more limited as his career developed, as he moved from his um, sense of a, of a comprehensive uh, moral philosophy to a political liberalism. And um, he was not very interested in the, uh, in Kant's own, as he regarded the metaphysical foundations for his moral theory, for his political theory, uh, he, and actually, Rawls was not interested in the details of Kant's political theory at all. He, can, he reconstructed his, Rawls's political theory from his, Rawls's understanding of Kant's moral theory without spending much time on Kant's own actual political theory, uh, which I think had some problems. And in some ways, I think what that really meant is that ultimately, perhaps Rawls didn't make as much of a separation between his political philosophy and utilitarianism as Kant did. 
Uh, Rawls's philosophy is certainly not straightforward utilitarianism, and it's not straightforward uh, prag pragmatism or prudential reasoning. He, he imputes to every human being basic human needs, and uh, he imputes to every human being the prudential rationality to try and figure out the best way to satisfy um, basic needs. Uh, but he also imputes to people, well, in his first phase, a fundamental moral concern with fairness, uh, and in his later more political phase, uh, a simply a desire to get along with other people, to find a modus operandi. And so he, Rawls pictures people as uh, who have a, either a moral commitment to fairness or uh, simply an interest in, in living with other people as entering into what he calls the original position. Uh, but then once they enter into the original position, basically using prudential reasoning to figure out what principles of justice they should agree upon. Um, and I don't regard, I mean, the whole structure is not merely prudential reasoning because there's either a, a moral underpinning or, or a political underpinning, but it doesn't seem to me to give quite the emphasis to the value of freedom itself that Kant gives. Um, and uh, because once the people enter into the original position in Rawls, they're thinking basically in prudential terms. They're, they're not thinking about the underlying value of freedom itself. Uh, and strangely, it seems to me that um, John Stuart Mill, who we think of as a util utilitarian, actually perhaps had a, had a greater recognition of um, the fundamental value of freedom in its, for its own sake and not for the happiness that it produces um, than Rawls does. So uh, I think, wonderful as he was, perhaps Rawls didn't draw all the lessons he might have drawn from Kant or from, in, so to speak, enlightened utilitarianism. Uh, and we have to, from whether we start from the Kantian side or from the utilitarian side, if we take utilitarianism in the form of Mill, that we get this recognition of the fundamental value of freedom for its own sake, and that has to govern all the rest of our reasoning. Well, that's, uh, that's not an easy question. Um, uh, because, of course, uh, as you know, people have been writing about Kant uh, almost since Kant's works first appeared, so that's 225 years. Um, there's an immense amount of literature. No one person can master that literature in uh, her lifetime, even if she works on nothing else at all. So the one piece of advice I would not give is to try to master everything that's been Read about, written about Kant, and then, and then begin on your own thought only when you've done that, because you'll never get there. So I guess the advice I would give is that you have to find some issue in Kant, some problem in Kant that that really moves you. Um, I know some people think that writing history of philosophy is like um, writing the history of. Uh, of uh, medieval times or doing astrophysics, that uh, relevance to contempt your own life and to contemporary life is not a factor. You just uh, are to describe the things that happened because they happened. I don't do history of philosophy that way. I really find that uh, somewhat difficult to conceive. I think you have to find some issue in Kant that really grips you. And then uh, of course, you'll want to read other, what uh, interesting scholars have written about that issue, and you'll want to be broaden your understanding of Kant's uh, system as a whole, so you can understand how he thought about that issue. You you can't you can't uh, think about any issue in Kant in isolation. He he was a systematic thinker, but and, and by systematic thinker, I don't mean that he had it all worked out and he laid down the principles of his system, and then he mechanically worked out the solution to this problem or that problem. His, his thought was constantly in flux, but he thought about things in connection, that's what I mean. 
And so you will have to think about things in connection too. You're interested in Kant's ethics or Kant's politics, but you have to understand the way Kant thought about philosophy as a whole. So you have to do that. Um, and that means over the course of time, basically reading all of Kant's works. And one thing that I myself found very helpful that I learned um, towards the end of my graduate studies when the great German Kant scholar Dieter Henrich visited Harvard for the first time, and I was fortunate enough to be able to take courses with him, is uh, you have to use all the materials that Kant left behind. He left behind published works, uh, which of course are a big enough challenge for us, but he left behind, uh, somewhat contrary to his own intentions, he left behind many handwritten notes and sketches and outlines of his thought, and you know, his students transcribed his lectures with what appears to be a considerable degree of um, accuracy, and uh, we have to use all these materials to really understand how Kant's mind worked and how he came at a problem, he came at a and one thing we can learn, as students, we can learn from Kant is he came back to his problems. He never stopped thinking about a particular issue. He, he came up with a solution, but he, he was never satisfied. And he would just keep coming back and back. Not, not in a pathological way, not like someone who keeps scratching the same wound, um, but because as his life progressed and his thought progressed, he he thought he could do better, and he thought he saw, understood better how uh, his solution fit in with his larger plans. And we have evidence of that in, in all of his writings, both his published writings and his unpublished writings. And we, both, we have to use that evidence, and we have to um, Well, uh, a number of different things. Um, I guess I, I keep coming back to these uh, issues about freedom and Kant, and uh, although I've written about them for, for 20 years now, at least, um, I keep finding more to say and slightly different ways of looking at it, and uh, so I've been writing recently about uh, Kant's earliest attempts to present the, this fundamental value of freedom. I've been writing about uh, very late attempts in his work to uh, show how uh, freedom understood in abstract terms essentially manif connects to our emotional life in rather concrete terms. I wrote recently a piece about um, the, uh, the role of moral feelings, especially in Kant's last writing in, in the Doctrine of Virtue. Here at this conference, we've been talking primarily about the doctrine of right, but this work concerns the doctrine of virtue. Uh, and I continue to be interested in that. Um, I will probably be putting together a number of recent papers um, uh, into another book soon. Uh, but actually, the main thing I have been working on in, for the last five years is a, is a history of modern aesthetics um, in which Kant plays a, a very central role, although it's not just a, it's not just a book about Kant, it's a book about aesthetic theory from the beginning of the 18th century to the beginning of the 21st century, but um, sort of what Kant accomplished and what Kant left out is kind of an organizing idea for the book. I'm happy to tell you more about that if you want to know. <laughs>